Okay, the parade's starting, but we're eating. So I'm going to set this up to try and catch it as it goes by. Yeah, here they come. We're watching a movie by Nani. I thought it was a great colloquial piece. Like I really got a feel for the characters who they are. But I just want to say, man, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry you wanted to just let us slip away from there. You know, I hope you get promoted or rich or all of you or whatever it is that maybe call yourself up here. Is a kind of character that I don't think I've really played, despite the fact that it's just probably more relatable than any characters that I've ever played before. I think with a lot of characters that you write, there's a lot of yourself in these characters, but there's also a lot of who you wish you could be. So for me, Hannah is even tougher and more independent than I think I ever could be. She has the wit that I wish I could have in the moment, but can maybe only have on the page if I have time to think about it. She's sort of uh, tough and vulnerable at the same time. She's very, very sharp. She's very witty. Hannah's a really smart woman. She's a writer, and she's taking this kind of intellectual approach to an emotional problem. She tells people that this is the way she's coping with this great loss, but I think deep down she knows that it's a way of never letting Hunter go. I think that she's had to put a kind of carapace around herself to survive this loss and Andrew's coming up to town is the, the beginning chisel to crack that open because I think that people in the town have been treating her with kid gloves. He's sort of the emotional bull in the china shop who is challenging her to buck up. Wait, why do you want to write this book? Because I have so much love left in my arsenal and I'm never going to spend it. The heavens really opened when Rebecca Hall was delivered the script, and even though she was in the midst of a Broadway production and wasn't planning on doing a small little indie film after the very busy year that she had, that she read it and came on board. She was like, just gives every bit of herself and works her ass off and gets and make her be talented and clever. I mean, it's great. It's great. Like, Cool. What's great about Rebecca and Hannah is that in real life, Rebecca is so willing and open and kind and this easy laugh and a hilarious person. How Hannah, I think, is that way, but she's had this event happen to her that has shut her down. And so what you want in that renaissance is that, you know, that phoenix out of the ashes kind of thing which has to happen to Hannah. And you feel it, you feel that underneath with Rebecca, because that's there. So here's the thing, this uh, researcher, whatever it is you're doing, told me, I, I don't want to get And Hunter would have kicked her ass for so many reasons. But I also think that he would have respected the take on the songs. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, respect me? The muckraking, star-hopping dickweed? Uh, I Andrew is, in Hannah's eyes, kind of uh, arrogant, citified, sort of pseudo-intellectual. On paper, everything that she's going to hate. And I feel like when she meets him, she sort of makes a decision to hate him on principle. Although by every turn, he turns out to be like-minded and there's this sort of parity between them. There's a genuine fascination and a genuine respect for her husband in Andrew's work that she finds herself a little bit fascinated by. I like that he's first and foremost a fan. I think he truly loves music. I think he truly loves Hunter. 
I think he has a little bit of a man crush on him. He genuinely wants to know what makes these people tick. I think his heart really beats for the, for the ones that, that gave so much of himself and turned so bright and then he found himself, you know, on the receiving end of death. There were, you know, previous drafts where he was a guy who had a band, you know, in college, you know, those that can't do teach. Here's a guy that can't get up on stage and sing his heart out, doesn't have that talent, so he just is trying to make sense of it all. Put a little method to the madness that is genius and, and, and you know, the artist. Uh, uh, do you have any idea how lucky he was? He falls in love, you know, and then you gotta fall in love with someone that loves someone that he loves in a different way, and that's just very complicated. I, you know, following someone else's footsteps that you actually respect and admire and, and it's gone. I'm not broken up with it, it's gone. I'm just drunk to grenade in my life. What do you want me to say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think everyone's seen him in a role like this before. And I think this is going to be a film that many will see and, and see him in a different light because of it. He comes into set every day having thought so hard about the reality, the actuality of who this character is, where he's coming from. His work is so intense and specific that it's a gift to me. I come on set and I'm like, I know what the scene is about, and he forces me to talk more specifically about what each turn is. Take after take. Uh, but you must have the You can't get that take after that. I think I'm safe. I thought he had like a little bit of And he's, you know, he's a great spy. She's a real main girl. Oh, you're telling me. Smells like pine resin, not beer, cold beer, and beer. Beer and head up. Grew up together. As they grow older, they sort of been around in each other's lives, and after Hunter passed away, Hannah realized his potential for, for a bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good guy in real life, but he's not going to be around for a long Diana brought a really interesting 
dynamic to Finley that you hadn't pictured before. We never wanted Finley, the girlfriend character that eventually has to get left by the wayside. We didn't want to make her easily disposable. We wanted someone who had a spark that was her own, that was unique and not exactly what Hannah had. The thing about Diana is she is just so vivacious and funny, and she and Jason know each other already, so they had this great connection, and I feel like they make their scenes come alive and in a very playful way. You're attempting the impossible. It's okay to ask for help. Yeah, thank you, Jim, but I'm not going to drop this in your gut. Upton is the owner of the little tiny local bookstore in Farmington. I guess you'd say he's kind of an eccentric local figure. very wise and very intelligent. I think that Upton is kind of an inspiration. A great best friend with a lot of insight to do. He's the behind the scenes guy who is the first one to recommend, you know, you know what? There's this guy, and he's really smart. He had to leave her to water a little bit, but she knows that he's right. He's always right. I don't want that. No, you're right. Yeah, I do. We're so done to him. And we shot all of the scenes at once. These characters limited to the bookstore, so we had these three or four days that were all ripping down all the time. And he and Sudeikis got together and just started clicking. And I nearly pulled the plug on Tumble Down and said, let's make a movie about these guys, this bromance. You know, he's just so playful and so it's fun. And you're going to make this a little bit of a He came to it so honestly and just wanted to make the character real. I think I found him as one of his phases. And he arrived and he knew exactly what he was doing and it was hilarious and brilliant to work with. She does this character and feel about his legacy alone. His legacy is 12 songs. Does the world care that much? You'd be surprised. Yeah, and what do you care about? Huh? Is this your golden ticket to tenure at some school where there's an ivy in the walls? A fan. It was my son. Linda is good night for her daughter. No, he sticks her nose in the door. If she's quite not supposed to, what's your hair cut? Put on some lipstick, you know, like that, you know, that classic kind of mom who is harsh, I mean, critical, but from a place of real love. Now, she's in a tough position, you know, as, as Hannah's mother, because obviously she is hurting that she lost her son-in-law, and she's been through this devastating loss for the entire family, but she also knows that the daughter is young and that, that there is love. She wants to give her a bond, not to, you know, say to that for my life. And her life got me to the point, so that she... I who's been in everything and done everything, and she's just so beautiful and serene. The character that she's playing is very specific to us. Desi and I had a very specific type of mother in mind, and Clyde could relate to it really, really well. She was such a great gift to work with, and also one of the sweetest people on earth. If you want the best look at, we can have the lemon squeeze, where you make like a piece of bologna between slices of toast. Or we can stop here, eat some granola, and pay our respects. Bruce is not my father. He's not based on my father in any way. This Bruce is based on more like some of my um, high school friends' parents. Good manner, hearty, and Hannah's apple of his eye. He's more kind of open and easy to hold. He's the loving, doting father, but he's also fiercely protective of his daughter. So thank you, old wise one, for the island of tall buildings. But teaching us native folk how it is. Richard has been in all of the films you know from the past few decades and beyond the incredible amounts of experience he has. He sort of raises the level of everybody's work because he comes on the set and is unafraid to challenge everyone to not just phone it in. I always admire him as an actress that's been fun to hear with him.
Gato. Gato here. That was the one. Good, beautiful. Thank you, guys. Yes, yes. Yeah. Desi has surely been living with this material for a long time. It's very close to their heart, and it's their first film, and it, uh, there's something really wonderful that comes with that. Because it's been with them for so long, I feel like the whole crew is just like, helping them deliver their baby. It's been a funny evolution of, you know, our relationship, you know, even on this film, because it was, you know, pushing the rock up the hill together for years and years and years, and then sort of once we've gotten it to the precipice, when we were cast and financed and getting ready to go, then all of a sudden, I feel like, you know, I was falling back more and letting him go with it, because, you know, it's director's medium, it's his thing. This is a film I think he's directed in his mind for a very, very long time, and came very prepared for the job. I trust what he says, you know, in that year's first film, but he knows what he's talking about. He knows how to talk to an actor. His, his notes are right. I uh, hit it off with him in ways. He's, you know, an odd duck in the, in the best way. He held that ship, point guard this thing, as, as well as I could have asked. This great combination of decisive and smart and visionary. And that he has a really strong sense of what he's after. But he's also been very, very open. He's been collaborative, you know, he's, he listens to the other ideas at all. And that's the kind of director you really hope to work with. Somebody who does, does dictate, but wants to have your input. I'm happy to be in on the, the entry level floor with Sean, because I think Sean's going to be doing really good things for a long time. I have nothing but trust in him, that he's the right person for it. He's so intimately involved in this this project, more, you know, as, as much as I am. He has a lot of anger in him. He came to the small town as a city boy that his girlfriend brought him to. The love story, I think, yeah, is something that he, he understands because their love, Desi and Sean's love story, I think is very much part of this film. Resources that we've been granted to do it are just mind-boggling. The incredible work that James Stewart and Amy Morrison did with these sets, the wonderful work that our DP Seamus is doing. I think as soon as he offered me a job, he was like, Seamus, I want this to be the best movie that you've ever shot. And I was like, hmm, that's a challenge. Seamus and I talked a lot about the naturalism and simplicity that we wanted for the aesthetics of Tumble Down. We wanted the images not to overwhelm the story, you know, not to push the emotions too hard. And the reason that I was interested in working with Seamus is that I'd seen that he was incredibly capable of making very natural pictures that still had the beauty and the glow and the romance that you want in a romantic comedy. Rich colors, very natural lighting, the sense that you're out, not in the middle of nowhere, but definitely out in nature. I really want you to get on the tears of the Okay. I promise you that. Is that what you would want? Do you get to say that? Why not? Because it's a conflict of interest. Life is complicated in love. Within that life, it's even more complicated. You know, I think there's a tendency to win imitating life through art to, to, to make things more black and white, and I like the, the gray. Thinking a little conventional, <laughs> romantic comedy, but there's a lot of that in there. Yeah. Well, it's not the same as the This is a story about having two sunlights in life and finding something. There's life after <laughs> the loss of love. Most people think a you know, relationship ends from one door closes. This is the last thing. Mm -hmm. I want 
to that. Fucking dickhead. Shade and sit. I'm shooting over your head. You just sit out, both you guys. Little dogs. Don't you be chewing on this screen, buddy. Nope, somebody lost their balloon. I sure would have thought the Brinks were sunglasses. Not here, wouldn't it? Can't see shit. Hey, <coughs> Here. You can see I can't see I have fun with anything man. Bonnie's coming. Huh? Bonnie's coming. Here. You do some sunglasses. You're not clean. I know where you live. Hey, you quit. How are you? Yes, don't quit. Stop! Lay down! Aslan, quick! Okay, 
Let's go get hurt. <laughs> It's an old Jeep, eh? Yeah, it's an old, a real old Jeep right there. There's a uh, new bars banner. Tinkers. <laughs> I wonder what she's giving out. Free drinks. <laughs> Puppy dog. You're like, hey, I'm not afraid. <laughs> and it is. I was like guessing what's on the LED screen. <laughs> You can't see. Well, my eyes got ulcerated from being out here with no sunglasses. You want so, me to hold it? So I'm still, I'm still like looking through a blur. From here, I'm like at fence length, so I can see a little bit, but. Crazy day. Yeah. Kind of miserable for the last parade. It was cold and clammy, remember? Yeah. She's giving out candy. We got a bucket. Ding, ding, ding. Anybody uh, gotta run up here and take a pee? Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> 
a bag out of the border body. <laughs> Ding, 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 ding. It always seems like they have to stop whenever they got music playing. You notice it? Yeah, it's like, come on, man. Take that on. Yeah. YouTube already don't like me. Google and Greed totally destroyed YouTube. Yeah. Hey, you guys quit it. Lay down. It's not like you purposefully are doing it, you know? All right. Look at the ponies. Got a bag. I said, so that girl's got a bag. Oh. <laughs> she wasn't passing nothing out, though. Maybe she gave it all away. Where's Aslan at? Can you hold Well, you continue to film. I'll go take a peek. I might have to zoom it out. Blankets and everything. Look at that. Blankets over there. Mm -hmm. They were smart to use a light colored blanket. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. 